So welcome for those of you hopping on, feel free to say hello in the chat box. Let us know where you're, where you're zooming in from today. Des Moines University, awesome. Southern Oregon, woohoo. <laughs> Hi, Lee Yannicka, Amy Brown. <laughs> Timory, <Marie>, hello. Hi, Jola, are you able to hear now? I, I see that you cannot hear. This is great for those of you just hopping on where feel free to jump into the chat and say hello to folks. Let us know where you're calling in from. Let us know if you have any pressing questions as we prepare in two minutes to hear some uh, stories, lessons from remote learning. So if you have any questions, any thoughts that you want to kick off with? We have an international audience now. Welcome, welcome from Peru, <laughs> across the US, Chicago, Seattle, Wakefield, Massachusetts, right down the street from actually where CAST is located. Although we haven't been in the office for months, <laughs> haven't been to Wakefield in a while. Fabulous, there's a State Board of Education here. Welcome. Lebanon, hello. No, Jola, you all are muted. Otherwise, there are too many people coming to this conversation. So the best way to communicate is through this chat box. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Megan Van Fossen. So we have one minute left. Please feel free to get some water, a snack, get comfortable and cozy. It's a beautiful day here in, in Boston, Massachusetts. Please feel free to set your comment box to all panelists and attendees so everyone can see it. All right, well, here we are. It's 3.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, hello, welcome today. My name is Allison Posey and I am thrilled to be with you on this summer day where we're going to be sharing stories, lessons from remote learning. So the school year ended with an unprecedented shift to remote learning and sometimes a radical change of our teaching and learning context can really hold up a mirror to our practices in a new, and sometimes exciting way, challenging way, but potentially very exciting way. So we're now really challenged to ask important questions such as who is not being included in instruction? Who is not engaged? Who is thriving? What are students discovering about their own learning strengths and challenges? Of course, we've always asked these questions, but we're asking them in new ways and we're paying attention to them in new ways. So CAST has been supporting educators to think about how to apply Universal Design for Learning, UDL. And now that we're turning to opportunities in remote learning, we're thinking about how we can support, how we can leverage UDL to support this unique period of, of, of emergency learning in response to the pandemic. 
Today, I'm so thrilled to share that we have gathered three educators together, um, really four, <laughs> we'll count you, Bill, <laughs> four educators together to tell their stories and to reflect on what they have learned from this experience. So our goals for today are to share their stories and lesson learned, and then to really engage you all in the conversation. What's resonating? What have you done? What are your stories? And then we're going to discuss how they're preparing, um, how these educators are preparing for the coming school year with all of the different possible scenarios that may come our way. So our big question for today is what new thinking can we take back to our classrooms to reach all learners? So to contribute to the conversation before we get into the, um, the, into the discussion, I do want to make sure that you're able to share. So thank you for those of you who are joining us live today from around the world and across the United States. Uh, but some of you are also joining um, via the recording and watching the recording. So if you're here during the live um, conversation, you have two options. You can chat in the chat box. So please make sure to select all panelists and attendees if you want your message to go to everyone. Or if you have something private that you just want to go to the panelists, you can select that. Um, and if you're watching the recording, you can participate through Twitter. So um, for those of you on right now, or for those of you watching the recording, you can hashtag CastPL or at cast underscore UDL to make sure that this conversation keeps going. So we are having it right now, um, but it can continue throughout. So if you're thinking of an idea in the middle of the night tonight, you can tweet it out and cast and folks on this conversation will be able to have access to it. This conversation, so yes, this conversation will be recorded. And um, we also wanna make sure that you have access to all the resources that are mentioned during, that, uh, during this webinar. Um, so Bill, on the next screen, we'll have um, a digital handout. So here's a link to the digital handout. It's a bitly uh, sharing stories um, hyphen NH because these educators are from New Hampshire, uh, up here in New England. And um, so all of the resources that are mentioned will be in there. And this is a live document that you can also contribute to. So as you're going along thinking, as you have resources that you think could contribute to this conversation, you have the opportunity to share in this, um, in this Google Doc. So Bill, do you mind actually showing us what happens when you click on this link? And Allie has put the link um, for you in the chat. Here's, uh, here's what this distance or this, this digital handout looks like. Oh, I see a lot of you in there. That's super fun. So our facilitators are in there with some contact information. You can see that some of the main ideas are in there as well as the questions we'll have. You can see that we have a spot for our webinar resources and some cast resources. But then below, starting on page three, is where we're going to have an interactive conversation coming up midway through this webinar. So I just wanna make sure that you're all able to get into that Google Doc and have access to that. So um, I see a couple questions in here. No, you all aren't being seen, but we are being seen. If you wanna turn on captions, we have a live captioner today. Thank you to our captioner for being here. There's a little spot on the bottom of your toolbar in Zoom where it says closed captions and you can just click on closed captions and have access to that. So Allie, are there any more logistic questions that you wanna share? Does anyone else have a question just about our, our logistics and our setup and our goals for today before we get started? All right, well then without any further ado, I would like to welcome our educators today. Lauren, let me kick off with you. Welcome Lauren Elliott. Hello, <laughs> so um, I'm a teacher at Winchester School in Winchester, New Hampshire. Um, I've taught third grade, kindergarten, and I'm going into my eighth year teaching first grade. Awesome. And this will be the first time teaching <laughs> in those conditions <laughs> with everyone else. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Welcome. Great to have you here today. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Sean Hilliard. I'm the principal of Ware Upper Elementary and Middle School. I've actually um, only been in public education for about 15 years now. Was a corporate trainer, worked at a nonprofit, ran a kindergarten, but I'm super excited to be able to be part of um, this group of educators and moving forward with what's going on in education. And um, just thank you for allowing me to be part of this conversation. 
the picture that you see is how you can still have fun masked in gloves. So maybe we'll have time to talk more about it later. <laughs> Yeah, that does. I was going to say a lot of questions came to mind when I saw that. At first, it just looked like a typical day, and then you see the blue gloves. <laughs> you know, these are not, not our typical times. Um, John, thank you, uh, Sean. John, welcome to the thank conversation. You. Great to have you here today. Thank you very much. Um, you, know, you know, Sean, that's a great picture. I saw that, and I was like, it's a wonderful picture. It looks like a lot of fun. So I'm John Fabrizio. I'm the Assistant Superintendent of Curriculum, Instruction, and Assessment way long title in Merrimack, New Hampshire. Um, been um, an administrator for almost 22 years now, which is kind of crazy how fast that goes and just have um, enjoyed every day of it, I think. And um, even crazy enough to say during this, this time of dealing with uh, the COVID um, pandemic we're dealing with, it still has brought great insight into education and there's, there's so many positives on a terrible situation that have come out of it that have allowed us to just grow um, as districts that, and schools that I never thought would be possible. So it's uh, really reframing and reshaping things um, along the way. So thank you for inviting me today. Fabulous. Wonderful to have you here. And I just want to give a little aside to those of you watching because we're going to have an interactive discussion. I've already gotten out a blank piece of paper and I brought out some of my oil pastels. pastels. So as they're talking, I'm going to be jotting down some notes and drawing some pictures. So as I heard words like, um, you know, growth mindset, I thought, oh, this is something that I'm going to write down that I might want to share um, in the breakout discussion. So we do invite you all, if you have post-it notes or index cards or if you you know do origami or <laughs> however you best share whether it's you know Twitter the chat box we do invite you as these educators are sharing to really start to um, reflect on what this is generating for you you know what it's making you think about in terms of the story that you have to tell and then what you may want to bring to the discussion that we're going to have um, in about a half hour so before we jump in to the conversation um, with these three educators with Lauren and Sean and John I want to introduce my colleague I'm honored to call my colleague Bill Wilmot, who many of you know because he's a CAST implementation specialist. He's working in the statewide New Hampshire UDL Innovation Network and other professional learning work around the country. Bill, thank you so much for being here today, and I'm hoping that you can share a little background with us just to frame the discussion that we're about to have. Yes, thank you, Allison. Um, yeah, so I'm Bill Wilmot, implementation specialist at CAST. Uh, really excited to be here today uh, to talk with our um, educators from, from New Hampshire. My role during this will be to prompt uh, discussion and then also to help us kind of connect with uh, UDL. Where are we seeing UDL in, in our own uh, remote learning stories? Uh, and then how would we imagine, uh, because we did this all in an emergency basis, how would we imagine using uh, that, uh, those UDL connections uh, proactively as we think about next year? So as Allison said, our context has radically shifted, right? So that gives us an opportunity to see things in a new way. Uh, and I kind of think of this like a, a painting, right? The frame kind of tells you what to pay attention to uh, in a painting. And then you see one of those details where the frame is shrunk down and you pay attention to new things. You see new details uh, and it gives you a new perspective on the whole. So our frame, our, uh, our, our context has been radically shifted. Um, and it's a very widespread shifting of that uh, learning context, right? Never has there been any change in education as large as what we've just been through. Um, our frame has been mediated by kind of the boundaries of this screen or whatever other mediated uh, uh, form of communication that we've had uh, with our learners. Uh, and it provides us an opportunity to see new things, right? Uh, and the, one of the big things that has really stu stood out during this COVID pandemic, um, and uh, whether we call it remote learning, distance learning, offsite learning, whatever we call it, it has brought new emphasis and new uh, light to issues uh, around equity, uh, issues around access, uh, and issues around how we collaborate with each other as educators, how we collaborate with parents, uh, and how we collaborate uh, between schools. Um, so what we're hoping today is that uh, telling our stories will be an opportunity to kind of process and understand this experience um, because there is so much to understand. Um, there's so much to mourn, uh, but there's also so much to learn from this. Things that went surprisingly well, things that did not go uh, well. Um, 
those issues of, uh, of equity, access, and, and collaboration. So today we're going to hear our uh, stories from remote learning uh, as a way, we're gonna hear and tell stories from remote learning uh, as a way of processing. And can I so, just add one thing to that, Bill, because please. of course, for you know you all being here today, we are going to bring our UDL lens to this thinking. We don't go anywhere really without this lens, but we're really going to try to call um, very intentional connections to UDL um, as we reflect on all of these different pieces. So here's my first application of that UDL lens. I've heard the phrase so many times uh, of going back to normal. Um, and I have a problem with this phrase. All right, there are two parts that I have a problem with. Um, first, normal, right? That the idea that we are returning to normal reinforces a normative way of thinking. The idea that there is a normal way of being, uh, which gets very close to a right way of being. So. Uh, what we were doing before was just a stop along the path, right? Was just a stop along the way of process, a, a process, a part of a process of constant change, of building, and hopefully of improvement. And then the second problem that I have with that phrase is the idea of going back, right? Time doesn't work that way. We don't live backwards. We can only take uh, the next step forward. So to me, this means that we have a real obligation to learn from the experiences uh, that we've had, um, and, uh, and, and when we return to our work, uh, to, to approach that work in a new way. So just a 30 second story to highlight this. I have a cat, uh, his name is Alexander. Uh, Alexander was an indoor cat until about a month ago when we started letting him out of the house. So Alexander is now an outdoor cat. There is no going back. Uh, this can't be undone. We're, we can't go back to the normal Alexander of being an indoor cat. Um, he has new experiences and he's going and he demands to go outside because now he knows what that world is like. Um, we have had new experiences. We can't go back. We can't undo that, but we can learn and grow from that. So the, a major way that I think we can learn and grow from that is uh, by, by um, focusing on the story that we tell ourselves and tell each other, right? This was an experience where we had very little control over the experience itself, but we do have control over the story that we tell ourselves about that experience. Um, so the story of the experience that we can control and we can use it uh, to support our learning, uh, to, to support the learning of our colleagues and ultimately the learning of the young people that we are responsible for. So the stories that we tell today are just, I think of them as the first draft of the stories that we're gonna tell our grandchildren about this experience. Um, and in only a few years, um, we're gonna have new teachers who will enter, uh, our, enter the profession. We're gonna have new learners who will come into schools. And our stories are going to create the foundation for those post COVID schools that they're coming into. So this next generation uh, will teach and learn in a world that has only known the reality of remote learning. So how do we work with that new generation to build uh, better schools, to build more equitable schools, more accessible schools, schools that are designed from the beginning uh, to collaborate with learners? So our stories are the beginning of that process. So that's why I'm so excited about the, uh, this uh, webinar today and sharing those stories. So Lauren Elliott is going to kick us off um, with uh, stories from her classroom and from her school um, and tell us about some of the ups and downs of remote learning. Uh, so Lauren, what, what did you experience? Uh, what, what did your learners experience? Uh, what was that like? So um, during emergency remote learning um, in New Hampshire, it was from about March to June is the time frame we had. Um, and the three things that I found to be most important were um, staying connected with students and families, um, keeping students connected with each other, um, and maintain students' love of learning. That was really important. Um, and these three things, they're not really new to educators, but I think that um, remote learning really highlighted um, the importance of these three things. Um, so first I started with connecting with families. That was 
that was the big first step um, in the process. So making that initial contact at the beginning, um, some might remember for at least in New Hampshire, we had a week to set everything up. So a part of the setup was connecting with each one of my families individually, giving as much information as I could. Um, one main thing I wanted to find out as well, talking to the families, was what barriers they had to face when it came to remote learning. So asking questions um, such as the amount of devices in the home, did they have adequate internet access, um, did, were parents working from home who had to continue working. Um, these questions would not only help me understand um, what my family's needs and challenges were, to teaching remotely. Now, a lot of these questions our school did like send out a big blanketed kind of survey to all the parents. So it was a whole school thing, but I wanted to kind of follow up on those questions. So taking the answers that from the school and just, just double checking just so I can hear it. And then they knew that I understood where they were at. Um, so, you know, that initial contact was also letting the parents know I was on their side, I was there for their child's education and to support them in any possible way that I could. Um, tools for communication when it, um, when communicating with the families, I made sure to off offer multiple means um, for connecting and communicating with me. So I made sure that my families knew they could email me. I put an extra phone line, um, a free phone line using Google Voice on my phone so I didn't have to give out my personal number, but you know, turn my, my personal phone in so they could contact me, text me. Um, I used Classroom Communication app, which I wasn't using, but I used Dojo was the app that I used. Um, and I wanted to assure my parents that um, I was available for them. Um, and I found that having that communication with families was really vital during the process. And I know, you know, we had good communication with my families before, but it, I, they really needed to communicate a lot and <laughs> make sure that they could communicate with me. Um, I also found myself being um, also a coach to my parents as well, coaching them, um, whether it was teaching my, um, teaching them how to, um, teach certain skills to their students, supporting them with using the devices, lessons I did. So really, I became like a teammate, a teaching teammate with um, my parents as well. And Lauren, can you tell us a little bit about the si your school and the size and just like give us a little paint the oh, yes. just a little oh, bit. Absolutely. So, <laughs> so our school goes from um, pre-K to eighth grade. Um, so it's pretty wide. And then we um, our high school students go to Keene, so we, <laughs> they go out of district, but we have um, pre-K to eighth, and we have about 400 students all together. So about three teachers per grade level. So there's about like 15 to 18 per class. So Lauren, one thing that I noticed in what you said is that you were acknowledging uh, that barriers existed right up front, and yes. even using that language with parents um, so that that uh, that kind of um, makes something real and then allows you to think about allows you to think as the designer about well how do i minimize that barrier how do i get around that barrier but then inviting feedback from parents about those barriers as well which seems really important yes and i also made sure to get a lot of it was constant feedback with parents week by week <laughs> as we went to make sure how things just, just to check in with parents to see how things were working as well as with my students and Lauren, how did having the multiple means of communicating with parents, do you think, make a difference in terms of the le level of collaboration you're able to generate? Well, I think it just, there's, you know, there's some parents that just aren't comfortable talking on the phone. Some, you know, they're so busy that a text is just an easier way for them to communicate back. And then some parents need to like wait till the end of the day, check all their emails. And, you know, that it kind of gave them different, different ways and almost, you know, if they needed to get a hold of me right away, a text or a quick phone call. If they was something I could answer later or they felt could answer later, they could use, you know, email to um, contact me. And even through our class communication app, parents could contact me through there. I kind of counted that as email because that's <laughs> kind of back and forth. Um, but yeah, just gave them just different options. Again, I had parents as well, the barriers where they might have been working in the morning or night. And I just want to give them different ways to reach me, but also kind of 
make sure I wasn't working 24 hours a day <laughs> either. Um, you know? Yeah, that crossed my mind too, that you have yeah. to be able to, you know, we know that teaching is emotional work. I'll take that line from David Rose, you know, co-founder of CAST and, and just ensuring that we, there was so much uncertainty going on with us as educators, mm -hmm. but you're also trying to scaffold the needs of the families, the needs of the children. Um, and there, there's also been a question, could you just share a little bit about the demographics in your class? Yeah. Yes. yes, we also, it's a um, low socioeconomic population. So uh, about over 70% of our kids are on free lunch. We have the free lunch grant. So actually our whole school, it qualifies for free lunch. So, um, and that's our, that's our demographic. And of course, we're going to assume variability. <laughs> yes. Oh, <laughs> yes. Okay. yes, and that, range oh yeah, we, we have a range, range, range of needs and, um, and abilities. And is your classroom fully inclusive? Absolutely. Yep, it is. And you picked this this quote to share with us. I did. Um, I actually saw this. Um, it was a video from um, Atopia, and it was a video on just the importance of connection with um, your students. And, you know, this quote has always resonated with me because that social connection with your students is so important um and you know it also worked with the parents too just that connection making that connection with the parents um and i wanted my students to know like even during this time that i still see you and i still know you and you're important and you're important to this community um so this quote really resonated with me and i wanted to share it um so staying connected with students that was really really important <laughs> um so um i wanted to make sure my students knew that i cared about them um that i you know could see them glad that they would you know be there they're important um and i wanted to replicate that the best i could in the virtual classroom because that's how I, I would greet them at my door every day um and i wanted them to get that some way so the first contact I had with each of my students, I made sure to be a, like a one-to-one -one video chat or a phone call to check in. Um, and during those first check-ins, it was just to just talk with them, just visit with them. You know, we were a week away. They were, you know, scared, nervous. You know, their whole worlds were also turned upside down. <laughs> um, so they were just kind of just check-ins and, you know, what what games are you into right now? What what TV shows are you watching? What do you want to, what do you want to play at home? Um, so that was another way to connect with them, find out what they're interested in. Um, if they couldn't one-to-one -one video chat, I also recorded little messages for them that I would either email to the parents for them to show or um, the classroom app we had um, offered a video um, where I could send individual videos to the students, like personalized ones. So that was just another way to stay connected um, with my students and Another big thing with that was I also wanted to make sure my students stay connected. So not just me staying connected with them. I wanted them to see each other. Um, so and I still remember our first zoom meeting with the little first graders and their headsets and how excited they were and just to see each other. And I realized that that was really important too. Um, and at first, having the kids being so young, um, I definitely need to rely on the parents to be able to set them up um, on the zooms. Um, but another way I gave um, the students a way to stay connected was I had parents, I encouraged parents to send me pictures of fun stuff they were doing, schoolwork they were doing, and I would um, set, send the pictures up on our classroom app and the kids were able to see and comment and parents um, were able to comment and say, oh, I, I see that they built that or that looks like a lot of fun. So just another way to keep them connected because they really missed that because I was thinking about their emotional needs too and they really missed each other. And so Lauren, as you, um, as you were providing these different options to first think about engagement and the social elements, um, did you find that all students were able to access and to be able to be part of those conversations in the, through the different options that you were providing? Or were there still some students that you felt like, I need to do an additional layer of, um, of options and flexibility? 
Yeah, well, a little bit of both. So um, once they started getting comfortable with the Zoom, I realized like starting my first Zoom, I was like, how am I going to do this with first graders? And the more we practiced, I could find I could do lessons with them. And then if students couldn't come to the Zoom lessons, I would have them recorded or do mini ones that other students who couldn't quite make it at the time um, be able to watch it you know through through our classroom communication app that had a video option and i could share it with all the students so um you know i was very cognizant of who could come to the zoom meetings i tried my best to schedule them where i could get the most student participation and a few times during the week and sometimes attendance was up and down and it's it was just how it was and if they missed a lesson um and i felt it was really really important that they got it i made sure to have it another form to send it their way and as you're sharing some of these examples, a question just came in that I want to connect this to. Yes. And that's, how did you find that you were really able to make um, your lessons robust and it wasn't um, just about kind of keeping to where things were and you're worried about getting behind, but how are you able to really feel like you were scaffolding the growing and continual learning of students and, and building on that um, in meaningful ways? Yes. Yeah, so um, definitely at the beginning, it was, we did a lot of review. It was, it was a lot of heavy review going over what we didn't need. And I still had a lot of students that um, were not even quite there yet to where they're expected to be. Um, it really turned to um, the the one to one video conferences with students because we're all one to one video conferences was really where I could individualize and it, it did turn to a lot more individualized learning and that so and after meeting with students um, for some one to one lessons which were like 15 20 minutes I could find different patterns of okay this group needs a little more help with this and that's kind of what I based my um, like my zoom whole class meetings on or emails that I would send to parents. Oh, I noticed, um, you know, these are some skills you could continue practicing on at home. Here's ways you can do it. Again, I also had to rely a lot on my parents as well to help with this. They were my co-teachers. So again, trying to offer multiple ways. <laughs> and do you want to share some of what's going on in this picture? Yeah, so this right here, this, um, the, one another way that I did it. <laughs> um, so I really wanted to maintain the love of learning and there is so much learning um, in everything and, and in the younger grades with the, the age um, kids that I work with, um, you know, their, their learning is free play and building and imaginative play. Um, games, nature walks, household chores. Um, and that was another thing I had to remind my parents of as well and and tell them how important that was, especially, you know, um, it helps with their developing their executive function. And there's all kinds of things like problem solving that they learn in free play and building. Um, so my initial meeting with students, you know, when I was gathering their interests, um, I actually had them start picking out things they wanted to learn about. So these, you might hear them as like uh, passion projects. Um, some people have like genius hours where they, you just learn about something you really want to learn about. So talking with my students, I would find their interests and they started to develop projects through that. So up here I have some pictures of, um, I had a student that really wanted to learn how to sew. So I started to fill her, we used Epic um, digital book profiles. So I was able to find um, different books on sewing at her level and fill her epic. So I got the reading um, and she, she sewed me a mask <laughs> was, was her project, which was really sweet. Um, another student I had just loved building Legos. So his project, he would build something new every day, send a picture. Um, I had another student really interested in, in growing plants, another one who, um, wanted to ride dirt bikes and learn about frogs and nature. So really, I just wanted them to pick something they wanted to become an expert in. And I would even find videos and send them to the parents, you know, hey, I found this cool video <laughs> on dirt bikes to watch. So um, sending my parents some resources. And um, the kids would take these projects and during our Zoom meetings, they would have a share time and be able to talk about um, what they were working on and what they learned about it. Um, 
it was it was pretty neat and i had one student that was really interested in animals and halfway through he decided to switch his animals but he did it on his own so his mom told me he was feeding his cat and there was a spider in the cat dish he went and got the tablet got on epic and looked up spiders and he changed his whole research about spiders just because of this so um some of the skills he learned on his own like where to find research he decided to do a whole research project on on spiders and it was um pretty amazing you know and lauren two quick questions so did yeah. you find that you were able to connect all of these um these individual projects to standards and that you were able to continue that learning progression um that quite you know kind of that question we had started with that you were able to really continue that learning and the standards and make those Yes. So um, I get through the books and reading. That was one way I could find books um, using the tool of Epic um, to find books at their reading level or books that could be read to them on their topic. Um, also just doing and creating. I connected it also to their writing prompts. So when we got into um, informational writing, um, that was one way to connect it to informational writing, something they were doing, what did you learn and give some facts or how to. So I was able to connect it to that informational writing. And did you find that this was able to also be useful for students with disabilities? Yes. Oh, absolutely. And they could, and they could pick whatever they were interested in so it was what they were doing if they really I had one student that was real about minecraft and wrote the best stories about what what they built and <laughs> what it was used for and the steps so it was pretty and pretty amazing so what i'm hearing lauren is that you had very clear goals right mm -hmm. uh, uh skill focused goals around reading and writing first grade goals right if ever i've yep. heard them yep. um and you were really kind of starting at the top of the guidelines there thinking about recruiting interests, right? How do I optimize choice so that they can focus on a topic and become engaged uh, in something that they're really interested in? And then how do I leverage that to support the academic learning that we know needs to happen? Yes. And we also connected to the speaking and listening skills too, because in first grade, they have to be able to answer, ask and answer questions. So bring in that sharing their project and what they have done. And they were asking really, amazing questions actually sometimes in in first grade you get the questions and they'll you know sometimes talk about a cat when it's not a yeah <laughs> they were asking really like how long did it take you to sew did you have to measure how many blocks did you use what kind of seeds so they're making really good connections with the projects that the other students were doing which i thought was pretty amazing connecting it to something that matters, really building yep. that expert learning skills and, and, and expertise. And um, did you have any particular um, you know, extra meeting to help scaffold parents to, um, to support some of this? Or were you really able to do it through that initial outreach that you did? Um, a little bit of both. So through the initial outreach, and then I would send once a week, I try to send like a update email to parents. Um, so I'd send it through that and, and through our communication classroom communication app kind of what we're doing um, and again encouraging parents to take pictures to share progress of what they've been doing um, <clears throat> so it was, it was actually a little bit of both a little bit of both of that set up at the beginning and then um, recruiting that help with parents and I also offered would offer um, the office hours for parents as well. So I know in the older grades in our school, like there was office hours for students where students could, you know, they'd be from one to two, the teacher would be there and they could pop in. I would offer that for parents as well. Like, hey, I'll be here and you can just pop in anytime if you have a question, because I know missing that that actual face to face and um, video calls is one of those ways we can reach that. Fabulous. So we're here at the classroom level and we're thinking about how we're connecting parents, how we're engaging students, how we're thinking about social elements, but we're also um, thinking about how we're scaffolding to standards and continuing the learning. And these flexible supports and options are, are, are there for all students. So, um, so students who, who, who you know, have, there, there's variability in what we're hearing and in and, and our speech and how we're able to physically manipulate and communicate. So these flexible options are in a lot of ways um, 
good for all students, essential for some, but good for all, even in these remote times. So Sean, I want to thank you, Lauren, for sharing this classroom. We're going to come back to you. But okay. Sean, you could now paint a picture from a principal level, looking at a school and thinking about some of these, some of these same questions and, and, and you know, extending this conversation. What has been your experience in this remote learning time? And what are some of the implications that, that you've been wrestling with, with as we've gone through the spring here? I'm going to start by um, tagging onto a word that I heard Bill say, and he talked about generations of teachers. And I have to tell you that I truly believe that there are going to be groups that look back on everyone who's listening on this, who's a teacher and everyone out there, and are going to see that you really are the, the greatest generation of teachers, because you are the generation who had to make this great leap. Um, and when we made that great leap, we, we really had to, as a slide says, we had to think outside the box, but it didn't just mean think outside the box, you know, I have to learn this new technology. It meant think outside the box about things like assessments and assignments and achievements. And I am a storyteller, so I'm going to tell you a couple of specific stories about some of these. Um, math teacher, really struggling to figure out how to assess his students, seventh grade math teacher. And so what did he choose to do? He sent out on his Google um, Classroom a survey out to kids and asked them open-ended questions and literally said, I'm not sure how to assess you on this content knowledge. Send me back some ideas. And he looked through all of those ideas and he decided which ones would in fact allow him to see whether or not the students had met the competencies and then sent out choices, a menu for students to pick. Um, how they would be assessed on that content. And that idea can go well beyond the one math content that he was looking at and talking about. Um, and that kind of goes into, leads really, really into that assignment piece too. Sometimes we um, even, you know, in our brick and mortar buildings would have ideas about how to give kids choices in assignments. But when we went remote, a number of educators began to comment on how some engaged students became unengaged, how some unengaged became engaged. And they truly began to see that they had to think even outside the fairly big box they had already thought outside of when they were looking at putting together, oh, you can do a PowerPoint or you can draw a picture and really start to look at ways to connect their real life experiences and to agree with exactly what Lauren was saying, to talk about their interests and to really be creative, thinking about how that content connects in ways that we may never have thought about before. Um, we had one very uninvolved student in a fifth grade classroom. Really, we, we emailed, we would call, um, it would get to me calling, talking to parents, just not engaged until they did the egg drop challenge. So they did the egg drop challenge and this student, he recorded himself, he had his parents take him, um, those of you who know our area, lots of you are not from New Hampshire, but to Pat's Peak, which is a local ski place, so he could get up on a high place to also drop it to gain more. They were measuring. And so this teacher reached out to me and said, can I just let this student cover so, as many competencies as he can figure out from this egg drop? So this child did ELA competencies, math competencies, science competencies, all building on that one experience. Um, another idea about even achievement though, is that idea of meeting the needs of all. We in this building historically have had some honors math classes. And so when we started to talk about what that might look like, what wound up happening, so I'll, I'll get to the end of the story so I don't belabor the story, but what wound up happening is the Google Classroom that was created for our honors seventh and eighth grade math got opened up to all of our seventh grade students and all of our eighth grade students. And so we had students who we would not have typically identified using the typical data points we look at that then began to engage in that math class. And so moving forward, regardless of what structure we're in, whether we're remote, whether we're hybrid, no matter what structure we're in, we in fact will be 
continuing with that same model. Our seventh graders, every seventh grader, will now be working um, in a heterogeneous classroom, but have the opportunity to access the honors material. So that's just so many exciting things that teachers did. Um, and you know, we can ask teachers and administrators to attend a workshop, to listen to a lecture, and sometimes we hear great things like backward design, UDL, but it doesn't mean as much until we're put in a situation where we start to realize we need to do this. And so many teachers began to respond to student and family needs, looking at how to respond to everyone's needs without really realizing that it was totally aligning to that UDL lens. So that was such an exciting thing. Um, my other little part on the side is about being outside the box. And so, you know, as educators, as parents, as students, everyone took on new roles in this. Um, we know parents have to become partners with us. Um, parents became partners in the education in a way we've never seen before. So there is such a great opportunity to hold on to that. We can't sustain what, or I don't believe we can sustain the model we had before with parents really believing they had to be the teacher at home, but how can we take their increased involvement and their increased understanding of what we do as educators and build on that to partner in such stronger ways? Um, students began to take more responsibility for their learning because they in fact were demonstrating to be quite honest, that they weren't as engaged sitting in front of a screen for four hours. Um, we'll get to the end of this and you'll be glad that it's over, even if you're loving it, because we can only sit here for so long. Um, and we look at our students and the developmental place they're at. And so we started to have students really advocating for changes and becoming actually their own educators. How exciting. And Again, as educators, people more and more became facilitators. We talk about the sage on the stage and we had to get away from that. I'll tell you, this forced us to get away from that and really become facilitators. Um, so, so those are some exciting growth models that um, I saw happen. Um, another quote I'll just throw out there or a phrase is post-traumatic growth. And that's what I'm gonna hold on to. This is traumatizing for everyone at, in some degree, but we'll hold on to, if we choose to, the growth we have from this, recognizing the stress and putting as many supports in place as we can for the stress that people are experiencing. There were so many UDL moments in there. I highlighted just a couple like this idea that the context really matters. And you know, you open up the design options for all learners, something that you maybe only did for this student or this group of students. Let's open that up and make it about the learning. And then you know, just the subtle language, the shifting from educator to facilitator. And someone noticed just how positive this is and really going after engagement. So lots of connections to what Lauren was saying in the classroom, you're sharing at the school level and just, kind of quickly and we'll get to John. Um, did you want to highlight a couple of these or um, share the, um, about um, a, a little spoiler about how to make lunch? <laughs> oh, sure. So um, this one we can do very quickly, this one slide. So some of these are resources we had before, but I've highlighted the ones that most educators had not used before and became um, really wonderful resources for us. Um, as I'm sure every person hearing my voice right now or hearing it later, we all became overnight experts in um, technology we had never touched before, but I would really encourage you to pick a few um, and really delve into them and put them into your toolbox to also help um, both parents and students not to feel overwhelmed. This is a huge list. You don't want to try and use all of these because you'll overwhelm everyone. But pick a couple to add to your toolbox that best match your teaching style, your students learning, and the content that you're teaching. Um, I have some pictures 
that do go along um, with some of the wonderful opportunities that occurred. Um, Ms. Bodine is our facts teacher, our family and consumer science teacher. She's a very experienced teacher. She's been in our building for many, many years, um, was not um, someone who utilized a lot of technology, but when we went to remote, she literally took it upon herself to learn how to make her own cooking videos and she has them posted on YouTube. So you yourself can get some of her amazing food. She's very um, interested in helping students um, cook healthy food. And with so many of our students staying home and having to be more self-sufficient, this wound up being um, so helpful to them. And you can see also one of our students who was watching one of those and making her meal. And we had numerous students send out to us pictures of them actually making the meals at home from this support. So just amazing. Um, the next one also talks or shows you a visual representation of that choice and, and students really driving the conversation of how they would cover this content. So our students were told they had to do an Earth Day project. Um, then we had some teachers who did live but recorded, so that ability to watch it later if you're not around when the teacher's doing it because of your family schedule. Some things that may intrigue them, get them interested, and then um, you'll see the further, the butterfly one is actually part of a project one of the students did was her poetry and then she continued um, from there because that was just something she was interested in. Really exciting, and again, just to follow up with Lawrence, you know, really having students and your, your comments of students really being the creators of their own learning and finding these really relevant examples um, that have meaning for them. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, and Allison, I'm hearing so much UDL and Sean that it's it's hard to notice all of it. Um, hearing multiple means of representation of content over and over and over again, and definitely multiple means of action and expression, right? How can we uh, make flexible and even give into the hands of students uh, showing what they know, right? I love that idea of asking students, what's the best way to assess yourself? What's the best way to assess? Um, that's uh, helping me as a teacher. It's helping them think about what's the goal, what would show that I know the goal, uh, and even do some self-assessment, uh, all, all built into that one question. Perfect, thank you. And then um, again, just we keep hitting on this, the core of UDL really is about engagement and we know that. So if we shift to the next slide there, Bill, um, we'll let Sean finish up with this, um, this, this focus of the SEL, social and emotional learning. So, so you're absolutely correct, but we also know, right, that our students can't be engaged if there's a barrier that's social or emotional that's getting in the way. So we already had a strong foundation for this, but when we went to our remote, we realized that there was a need to increase that, right? This was a greater need in this remote environment. So we have something called the Student Success Center where students would take breaks and, and um, process through difficulties they were having. Those people um, in that, those positions who are registered behavior technicians, then created their own Google Classroom. And we had 430 students out of just under 600 join it. And they would post questions, they would check in. If they didn't hear from a student, um, after two days, they were making individual connections with that student saying, you know, what's going on? Do you need some help? And then that conversation would trigger perhaps some other types of support, depending on what the answer was. So this was just one um, example. And you will find links someplace or at the end. Um, we worked on an entire curriculum during um, remote for social and emotional. So you'll have access to that. Feel free to borrow. Do not reinvent the wheel. Um, and I'll also tell you that we're going to start with celebrations when we come back, spelt with an S. So we'll be doing um, some special events that will really focus on rebuilding connections or making new ones um, when we come back in whatever format in the fall. 
Fabulous. Thank you so much. Again, my head is spinning. I'm excited. I want to go back into the classroom in the fall. So this is an empowering moment for us as educators to be able to take these lessons learned, leverage all these tools and think about what we're doing for some students and opening it up for all. So John, thank you for, for being here and from, you know, you kind of get this this moment to be able to think about what's happening in the classroom and the school and then your role and, and tie it together here for us. Yeah, um, you know, thank you. I just sit there and I, I'm listening to these stories and it's so hard because I want to start telling a lot of teacher and a lot of principal stories around the district. And I'm saying, no, John, stay where you are. And, and let's talk about from, a, from a, a district perspective when the oh no happened. And, and I have a little ambulance here because I think that's how it felt on the first day when uh, we decided in Merrimack that um, the Wednesday before the governor's Sunday announcement, we had an emergency board meeting because remember when this hit, it was right after February vacation and we had students traveling internationally. We had adults traveling internationally and all of a sudden it was like, oh goodness, you know, and then um, places in the, in the world that were identified as, oh, don't worry about them to all of a sudden, oh no, worry about them. And that all happened, if you remember, in, in a three-day period, in a three-day time from, from this kind of going on. And we were like, oh, no, we have a problem. Let's talk. So we decided as a district, let's go out for two weeks and clean our schools and, and give some time and, and reorganize. Well, we didn't know going out meant we're out and we have to figure remote online learning. Here we go. And in that, you're only as strong as your foundation. And that's what I've believed for a long time and I believe it. But like a house, like once you have that foundation, like a house, there's many ways in and out of that, that house, you know, windows and doors and back doors and front doors and things like that. And you have to have that understanding of there is no way anymore just through the front door. That's not possible. So we have to think of other ways to design our system of remote learning with multiple means of engagement, multiple means of getting, um, getting our education out there. And um, I'm gonna relate my first story to um, an Avengers story because I'm an Avengers fan. And Thor and Ragnarok, there's a scene with Odin, his father is there and he, and Thor has just lost his eye and it's an awful moment in his life and he thinks he's probably dying and doesn't know if he can make it. And he's at that, that absolute brink of an end that I think we've all felt at some point during this time. And Odin turns to him and he says, um, you know, Thor, Asgard is not a place, it's a people. And it's an organization. And he says it to him. And that kind of thinking is how we began, I think, when we met with our leadership team, the first part that we're stronger than the brick and mortar and we're stronger than that building we have. We have connections, we have relationships, we have um, buy-in from our, from our community and our school board. Um, now, how do we move this forward knowing those are all the givens we have? What do we do to design a system that's gonna help us get out there? It was the Wild West, let me be honest with you. There was a lot of, there was a lot of different educational platforms, Google here and, and um, you know, we had Google in this area. We had power school learning across the district. We had, you know, um, um, we had people who wanted to explore Canvas. We had other things going on that we had multiple platforms. So that wasn't the most positive thing, but the positive was we all, like, um, like um, you know, Lauren and, and Sean both said, we learned technologies that we had no idea were available to us. And we went out and did that. And um, I, I bless our technology uh, coordinator because she, on day one when this happened, ordered um, about 600 Chromebooks. She says, I'm just putting the order in. Because if she didn't do it, we would have never got them. Everyone else back ordered. That's how it happened. And we gave them out. And that's what we did. We checked them in through our library system. And we said, we need to find the right tools in our toolbox to be able to do what we need to do for students at home. So from an organizational point, we got those out there. We got hotspots out to families that, that didn't have good, good internet connectivity. 
we bought our high school counselors burn phones because we knew we had to connect with kids and they they had they had they texted and and it's funny because some of these were seasoned veterans as we talked about and and probably weren't as versed in in the, the language of texting as as maybe others might have been and and it was funny when we told our story kind of um, at the end of the year we did some reflective back about what worked what didn't work what would you change differently um, it was funny to hear them tell them stories about how they learned a whole new language through text how to communicate with kids at the high school and i said how interesting and and neat for you and and you know and moving forward it's made us make some decisions on next year which i'll talk about later but it's really thought about how are we communicating and and like your foundation i talked about communication is the key when you're in crisis no matter what when you're in that house and there's a flood outside or a hurricane or something happening you have to find a way out but you also have to communicate to your family members and that was a lot of it so right up front as a district we designed kind of um our goals and expectations and we did that and we said if we don't start from there then how do you develop and be creative if you don't know what you're being creative about so for our teaching staff we did a goals and expectation pamphlet and we made it colorful and fun and a lot of uh, a lot of us that we listed some work with some of our art teachers who were strong in that area and others that had a a former background background in graphic design we brought them together and we created brochures one for teachers one for our support personnel and then and then another one for families and and students and sent them out and said here's how we're going to function and here's your expectation here's our expectation here's how we'll communicate here's the multiple here's the multiple expectations of there'll be office hours for everybody and there'll be times to zoom and if you don't know how to zoom here's where you can find a video posted on our website and how to zoom and we did a lot of those um creative different things that we probably should have done to be honest with you five years ago when we started working with udl and cast and ubd and all these things john if i could just pause for just a moment what is yeah. so exciting to me is that it what i'm hearing is students are just as empowered to lead here's a technology tool that works mom and dad let me show caregiver wh wh let me show you teacher let me show you so it's not just teachers saying here's right going to be this is what it is but it's really opening this conversation you had the goals you knew what you were going for and then everyone was able to contribute to the conversation and that's a community I mean that's a whole new definition to it um, in a flexible way that's really inspiring okay and now I'm gonna zip it because you've got more good stuff coming no and and, and then we have this whole um, we five years ago um, started a, a mental health and system of care um, um kind of a cohort in our district and they were such a strong influence i think on us making decisions to take care of our take care of our kids we were part of project grow with the with the state of new hampshire and it really a lot of training by cassie yackley on on trauma-informed schools and we did a lot of that work to have trauma in four areas in our schools and it was hard to take that to the home take that out and do that so we we, we did a lot of webinars um, for our staff. We created on our, on our district website and it said social, emotional, um, learning and care. What don't you know? And that was the name of it. And it still exists still on our teacher porthole website that they can go in and there was multiple webinars for them to learn more about you know how you're presenting information or what don't i understand about um the the child i'm with and a lot of that self-learning um, could happen for our teachers remotely and it was all you know free resources and here they are and we had our team continuing to meet every, we met every friday morning from nine to ten through this entire time from march to june and we kept on creating resources and feeding that website and pushing it out to people so they had an opportunity to self-learn during this so the learning didn't stop for our educators either through yeah, one program. of the things that i'm hearing there john is that you're modeling the type of learning and learning design that you want the educators to be going uh to be engaging in right so you the leaders are leading learning um, you're being clear about what the goals are in that expectations document. You're being flexible about the means. Um, you're modeling your own uh, and sharing your own learning process uh, through all of the communication that you're doing. 
Yeah. And then the, the next step on this is to go back to our found and I go back to foundation again. The foundation is we've had um, we've had a lot of UBD put, um, things in place and have worked with Jay McTie, um, you know, over the years to really develop our curriculums with that backwards design model in place and thinking of the end in mind. So we went back to our curriculums, and this is more in my, in, in my role. Um, okay, here we go. We're all, my, <laughs> the entire student population of 4,000 kids is now out, out and online. What do you do? So we went back to essential standards and essential components and transfer skills. And that's where we spent our time. And we said, you know, we're going to come up with six to eight power standards for every curricular area, pre-K to 12. Here we go. Let's get teachers together. Let's figure this out. And we did that work and then came up with some common ways of reporting. For example, we kind of just didn't use our report card at the elementary level. We went to a portfolio assessment. Here's, here's the standards they are. Here's multiple assignments in this area. You show us what you think your best work is. And we'll assess that for your final, for your final, um, your final quarter grade. Those are some things system-wide we did. At the high school, we suspended um, our GPA. We said, you know, we're not in a normal time right now. We have no evidence base around this. We suspended GPA and still graded. And we said, we're still going to grade, but we're going to not have this overall time. when We're not sure yet it's the best quality and the rigor is there. We don't know. We're still going to go through and give some flexibility to this, but still require the effort to happen in the, in the work because you will be graded, which then goes forward with the rest of your year. And offering and it offers credit at high school. Yeah, and John, I imagine it requires that you really know what success looks like so yeah. that you can assess in these flexible ways. And by really understanding that, it pushes us towards expert learning. It pushes us to think about, well, how do you use this in the workforce? You know, what are those greater skills, those those core pe those core skills you were talking about that are so important to isolate, regardless of the age of the learner, we can start scaffolding and building those skills and knowing what success looks like so the students can self-evaluate awesome 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 so then then i decided you know what i'm gonna take this a step further like you know bill's worked with me for a few years now knows that i kind of like to push that envelope and i said i bet you jay mctie right now i have a few questions for him on a reading a couple of his uh you know design books because we're in that part of redoing our our strategic plan and a few other things so i've been reading about him and during this COVID time when i was home like the rest of us and i reached out by email and within 10 minutes jay responded to me and, and then he says, I'll give you a call. And I sat there and froze and said, oh, goodness. So I spent a, 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 an afternoon for three hours talking to Jay McKay about education and remote learning and his thoughts on it. And then we set up a, a webinar that Bill got to participate in with over 150 of our educators across the, across the, the, uh, the district to really come back to the foundation of transfer skills. It goes deeper than essential questions. It comes now down in this remote time, what can be transferable that le leads them with their own foundation to move forward to the next grade level. And that was hard work. And that was really bending thinking about, well, I've always taught this in May. I've always taught this in June. You know, so again, to Bill's point, it's made us get a new normal out of this. And I think that that new normal has led us to really believe that we won't go back to something we were at because we've been able to use some of the tools and our foundation that we had in place to a higher level in, in doing this. So next year, I mean, we'll talk about next year in a little bit, but we already have our plan going forward, what we're doing as a district. And that's huge because it's allowing us to say, what are we gonna use out of that remote time for when we have some people in person and for some people remote. So it's kind of got to take advantage of that moment because you're leading us to the next part. And yep. that's to give you, so you've heard three stories now. You've heard a classroom educator, you've heard a principal level, you've heard at a district level. And I've been jotting down my messy notes and I hope you've been taking some notes as well. But what we'd like to do, we're just going to take five minutes in the interest of time. Uh, take five minutes and we have the digital handout. Here's the link to the digital handout. Um, which Allie will stick in the um, chat for you and Bill's pulling up. And we want to invite you to share your stories. So you could either share, we've added a couple sentence uh, starters for you in there. 
So um, for example, in this remote learning time, um, what's been a high? What's been a challenge or barrier for you? What's been something that's resonated during this webinar for you? What's something you wonder? Or how are you going to, to kind of get back to what Bill talked about at the beginning? How are you going to start to tell your story about remote learning? So we want to give you a chance to either, you know, draw, write, uh, you know, if you want to go record your voice for a few minutes on vocaroo.com, upload an image or just add right into this uh, shared Google Doc. This is an opportunity for us to just take five minutes and share together in this shared Google Doc. Um, so we hope that you're able to access that. We'll be watching the chat here if you have any questions, but feel free to just start adding to that Google document, any of those sentence stems, any of those prompts, anything else that you want to share with us and the larger community here, because this is a document we can take with us. So we'll pause here for five minutes to let you all begin to share your stories. And Allison, just one thing I wanted to add to that is read other people's stories too. Um, this is all about sharing, uh, both telling and hearing. Uh, and if you have a response to somebody's story, just, uh, just, uh, tab the bullet over like that and respond to, uh, to their story. If you're comfortable adding your email or name, please feel free to do so. You can plus one another idea if you start to look at someone else's and it's resonating. Please, please, please feel free to plus one it.
we could take about one more minute, that would be great. Thank you. And some of you are adding ideas in the chat and that works perfectly as well. And I want to note the power of we have over 100 educators on this call right now and we're all contributing and sharing stories, things that resonate, things that you want to try, things that have been happening for you and your students and your parents through this. So I really want to take a moment to thank you for opening up. Um, we've, I think, been challenged more so recently to really share some of the vulnerabilities, um, share some of the students that that um, that school's not working for and really try to brainstorm together. So whatever tools you have, whether it's a Google document or a Flipgrid or a Padlet, really um, trying to, to figure out ways to bring the community together to collaborate and empower each other to take the actions that we can to get to the vision of deep learning, the vision of engaging all students, the, the vision of connecting with our students in meaningful ways. Um, so if we can pull back here um, to the conversation, I want to give our panelists a chance to just kind of give us a quick and dirty here's what you're gonna do and I know that's a really big question for a short amount of time but um, but we have a couple just kind of top three things that uh, you're going to take as we move into as you move into the fall here and uh, Lauren we'll begin with you yeah so um, three things that I'm definitely gonna take into the fall is you know that developing that social social connection with students and families and I want to do that a lot earlier because um, we have remote learning. I want to start making those connections um, before the school year starts um, to help build that strong foundation. Um, so I've been working on like a, a digital survey to send to parents, also one that I can mail to parents, um, and like a postcard to students, um, and just start making those little connections here and there to start that early. Um, and then next, um, you know, what can I do to help my students be independent? And right now, um, I'm part of the committee to decide, like, we're in a lot of schools, we're trying to decide what's opening going to look like. So we're planning for that. So I'm really thinking, what do I need to do to help my students be independent? <laughs> um, because during remote learning, we kind of expect a lot of our students to become expert learners um, right away. like throw them right into it. Um, so again, planning with my teammates um, and other colleagues and, and with um, develop, professional development like this, um, thinking about, okay, what scenarios do we have? What would independence look like? What are things that I could use independently in the classroom? But then if we had to go remote, could transfer to that easily because we could even be looking at a back and forth. Um, so really, what are, what are the things that I need my first graders to do independently. What can I do to help them, whether it's in the classroom at first or remotely? Um, and also, you know, thinking about all the new resources that we have um, gathered and learned how to do. Mini lessons, so we could think, how can we use those in, the classroom and remotely. So things that we've. Well, Lauren, I'm sorry, you're cutting out a little bit. Um, oh, I can. That's OK. Can you hear me now? Yes. If you want to even turn off your video and keep going. Yeah. Let me turn off my video. <laughs> I'll st quickly. Um, so examples. Um, 
things to bring next year. Um, we, as I said, we recorded a lot of videos um, for students, whether it was for books, um, read alouds, mini lessons. Those are things we can use in the classroom and um, during remote. Um, and also teaching students um, what technology do I, would I like them to learn in the classroom. We do have computers available um, and iPads for the students, not one-to-one, -one, but we have some devices. So how can I um, teach them how to get on um, to those devices independently? Because that could help as well. Um, and then again, um, another takeaway is really strive for ways to encourage students to love learning and um, the passion projects I talked about that was kind of developed through remote learning is something I'd like to take um, into the classroom um, next year and work that and that's something a project that could possibly be done, you know, with the flipped classroom kind of thing work on do things and <laughs> um, What can I do in class. What can they do um, remotely at home if it goes that way. Um, so those are just some of the things that I would like to take into next year. Amazing. And Lauren, thank you. I appreciate how you're noting. I'm going to do this regardless of where we are and regardless of how it's going to be done. Those are the pieces that you're going to develop. Thank you so much. Sean, what are you going to take, take to action? So across our building, I already touched base on the first one, that, that SEL, that we have to set aside um, multiple opportunities. Um, some of our relationships are broken, not because something bad happened between the people. They're literally just broken because of our distancing. Um, and so we need to focus on that to set the stage to be successful in our academic content. Also though, the second bullet point about non-negotiables, I just want to point out that I think this has to be non-negotiables for all the roles. So we're going to really put together what students should be doing when they are in fact in a remote classroom environment. You know, they should try and find the quietest spot in their location, those types of things. But in addition to that, staff, what are non-negotiables? We looked at our survey results and also just um, anecdotal results from student, staff, and parents. And we really need to be at a place where students are consistently getting some live lessons that are then recorded, you know, other types of resources. But we had teachers doing the best they could in the moment they found themselves, but with vastly different experiences for our students. So that's what that non-negotiable, but I need non-negotiables too. So admin need to make a commitment to um, having availability for students, for staff, for parents, and really having that structure in place again across our building and across our SAU. I mentioned this in our shared document too, but there actually needs to be more opportunities for collaboration. I believe we've seen the value of collaboration. We have teachers who used to kind of teach in silos because they really loved their content and they saw and they were expert in that content. But when we begin to open that up to more project-based learning, to more sharing of planning, we literally do lighten the load. So that's the good part um, for teachers. But we actually just offer better opportunities for teaching and learning when we do that. So we're going so far as to looking at the potential of families who opt for remote only, of sharing educators across our district or among some different SAUs that would be in charge of those groups. We need to share our resources and collaborate in ways we have not done before. Um, and you know, we saw students who were successful, so I am on my last bullet point, that blended learning, um, depending on the structure we come back, but we have a concept of some very small instructional spaces being set up for a live stream of a class for that student who did so well remotely and really has a hard time managing to access the curriculum in a classroom with numerous other students. Why don't we still give them that option of the structure that worked for them when they were out of the building? Um, so that's um, the last one and all those are going to be with us whether we're here, whether we're not here, or whether some of us are and some of us aren't. Amazing, thank you. And John, what are your next action steps? So I think that really um, it comes back to um, our schedule. It starts there. You know, we really have to think about what does our schedule look like? How do we increase time for learning and in, in, in when we're back in the buildings? And really how do we find, optimize? Because I mean, I'll, I'll say it, it's out there. We're going back in a hybrid model. 
Um, and it's um, already been publicized. It's on our website, in the Merrimack website, and it wants to look at it. And the big PowerPoint I did Monday night there. And um, this is the time when we're, we're, we're talking about that as a community, about what we like and dislike and all those things, and that's part of change. So we'll do it, and we'll come together and, and answer all those questions that are there. But we are coming back on a hybrid model. We didn't feel it was safe to come back full time. So we're not, and, and it comes down to student safety. So we made that decision. Um, and then um, really we're gonna look at again, back to essential standards, our foundation. What are five day essential reporting standards that we can have across all curricular areas? We're doing that work now. We did it last year for the, for the last part of the second semester, but now it's for a, a full semester going forward. So we decided till October 31st, we're gonna be in a hybrid model. Um, after that, we'll reassess, see where we are, hopefully be back full time. But we created schedules that are flexible to that. And then scope and sequence is so important to have that hybrid. We have to know what kids are doing while they're with us and while they're home and be able to plan that and have weekly goals that we want to accomplish that are done through our curriculum. And again, utilizing UDL concept, it's all about that. And I'm so happy that we are, are part of the UDL network and we have seven teams that are flourishing and you know, Bill, I think, may be a full-time employee now in Merrimack. If he's not yet, he will be next year. Um, We're not and, letting him go from CAP. And there you go. <laughs> and, and I think that he has been very busy with our facilitators and with me just connecting the dots. And I think we'll continue to collaborate and do those things. And then our technology has to get better. We need a consistent platform that permeates both in the classroom when they're there and when they're out of the classroom. So all assignments are in one place. In, in parents and kids that are there or you know that are fully remote or that god forbid may be ill and out for a few weeks you know need to have a consistent place to go for assignments and know that they're there and and learn to build that trust around technology and the platform perfect thank you and now i want to give you all 30 seconds out there to write one action you're going to take what is when you you record it for yourself on a post-it note in the chat on the twitter and the google doc and that really helps you remember to do it i sometimes write it on my hand so take 30 seconds and write down craft um craft your here's what i'm going to do the action i'm going to take So we do want to remind you that this is being recorded and we'll make that available to you. The Google Doc will continue to remain um, available to you. We've put a lot of the resources in it, the Jay McThigh Backwards Design, Responsive Curriculum, UDL, UBD, the survey opportunity. Oh, um, and there's a survey opportunity there um, as well. Bill, do you just want to briefly mention that? Oh, you're on mute. At the top of the resource document, there is a link to a survey that uh, some of our researchers at CAST have put together uh, to really try to understand the experience of teachers during uh, remote learning. So we would encourage you to take that survey. Um, that will kind of help us kind of process and understand from a research perspective what the remote learning experience was like. Awesome, thank you. So we hope you continue to come back to this. And we have a couple last words we wanna share uh, with you. Here's uh, a quote from Mr. Rogers. Uh, Imagining something may be the first step in making it happen, but it takes the real time and real efforts of real people to learn things, make things, turn thoughts into deeds or visions into inventions. Bill, did you wanna, do you wanna comment on this any, any further? Well, one of the big themes that I have been hearing through this whole thing is that um, as, as uh, John was talking about, there's still a community. As Lauren started off, those social connections are so important. And in fact, 
this revealed the opportunity to remove some of the barriers that we thought were always there, right? The barriers that are the walls of our classrooms, right? So teachers were collaborating in new ways. Uh, Sean was talking about schools and districts collaborating in new ways, right? Beyond the barriers of the walls that we built uh, and this experience and the tools that we developed and used during this experience uh, allowed, allows us a new way of thinking about how we collaborate and turning those visions into, uh, into the thoughts and deeds and reality. Amazing, amazing. Uh, another last word is every student can learn, just not on the same day or in the same way. And so we know this, we've known this for so long. John, did you want to comment on this at all? I just think that, that I try to, to think about that a lot in, in, in my role and my former roles too, is that, that you know, there is no one way to learn. And I don't think that we can, we can ever assume that or, or even assume that um, our brick and mortar buildings were the best environment. Absolutely. And I, um, I just, I want to take a moment to, to note that UDL can provide us with um, a pathway, a closet, uh, a repertoire of strategies to be able to think about the different ways that we can offer for all students, all educators, all of us to be able to do our best learning. Um, and you all have probably taken some time to, to just self reflect on your own um, experience during this and learn more about your own selves as learners and what works and and what doesn't work and what you want to go back and be able to maximize but also what you want to change because um because as bill noted at the beginning um back to normal really we that that really doesn't have a strong meaning so so we can think about that in hopefully new new ways um lauren uh sean any last words any last thoughts that you want to tie together here for us open your oh, mute sean or me <laughs> Lauren, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> no, I just, just um, everything um, that was just said. Um, I'm I'm excited to go back next year. I'm scared to go back next year. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty, but I think you know, listening to Shauna um, and and everyone speak um, that staying connected, especially with your colleagues to get that support too, because we're all in this together and, you know, I've been in it together for about, and just, you can find so much support from colleagues in your building, reaching out all across <laughs> all the people. I saw someone was from Peru and from all, <laughs> all over the world, but just having that, um, sticking together with that educational community, I think it'll be really important for all of us because again, we're, we're all in this together and we can do this. <laughs> we got this. And you're right. It's amazing. Globally, we are all in this. It is really exciting. And Sean, do you have any last thought? A uh, last thought? Um, well, I'll try and do it quickly because I know we're running out of time, but I am going to use my analogy now. So I joked that um, when the governor first came out and when we were first told two weeks, right, out of our school for two weeks, that was our sprint. And, you know, when you run a sprint, you don't have to do a lot of training. You can see the end. You can run. We can all do it. You know, we might have been really tired at the end, but we started to get to the end of that. And we got told, no, it was much longer. So suddenly we were told, nope, we were running a half marathon. And some of us rolled our eyes and said, oh, my gosh, I can't do this. A half marathon? you gotta be kidding me but you didn't have a choice so you started out and along you went and you know what it was okay it hurt there were aches there were pains we were exhausted but we were doing okay the end was in sight until all of a sudden they told us it was a marathon and once we got to that point we suddenly realized the day that that was announced that day was when we hit heartbreak hill and those of you who know the boston marathon right there's Heartbreak Hill, but please also picture all those people who stand at Heartbreak Hill to cheer you on. People are cheering you on, educators. Teachers are, students mm -hmm. are, other educators are. And you know what, I hate to say it, but we are facing another marathon. Here's the great news. We now know we're facing the marathon. So when you know you're training for one, how much better a place are you in to run the marathon? We know now, we know the tools, the training, the exercises we need to do to finish that analogy. So we are facing a marathon. I know it and you know it, but we're <laughs> in such a better place and we're gonna finish and we're gonna finish strong.
Awesome. And we just invite you all to continue this conversation with us. We have an awesome symposium coming up called UDL Rising, where we can really think about designing for equity. That's coming up August 5th through 9th. It is online. Lots of opportunities there. If you can't join, please follow the hashtag UDL Rising. We also have a lot of books out from Cast Publishing. Here's one that has done really well thinking about all this virtual learning going on, UDL in the Cloud by um, Katie Novak and Tom Thibodeau. And uh, if you use the code UDL summer, you can save 25% um, until July 31st at castpublishing.org. We also have a newsletter. CAST is an organization that has a lot of research going on, a lot of professional learning, a lot of design. So sign up to hear what's going on at CAST through our newsletter. And we want to hear from you. So we have an opportunity for a survey. What worked well for you in this webinar? What other topics do you want to have? What suggestions do you have? And we would love to hear from you. Thank you so much to to the panelists for joining today. Thank you, Bill, for facilitating. Thank you, Allison, for driving this. this and thank you all for joining. It was amazing to get this international group together. So please keep in touch. Thank you, Ali, and the captioner and all of the behind the scene tech folks. Have a great, great day. Make it a great day. <laughs>